I adore historical fiction, and this is something that kind of creeped up on me. I didn't realise how much historical fiction I had read. I don't know when it happened, but what's fun about historical fiction is that it can pretty much do anything. Historical fiction can be written by anyone, from anywhere, and the more variety the better. That said, the most popular historical fiction usually is British, probably followed by American, and historical fiction can very cleverly cross with different genres, like mysteries and thrillers, or even urban fantasy and definitely the gothic. So what I've got here is a relatively broad selection of 10 historical fiction books that I would love for you to check out if you haven't already. Some of these I read ages ago, others I only just got to, and they are all books that I hugely, wholly recommend. Let's go. I'm gonna start strong with one of my favourite novels of all time. If I ever did an actual ranking of my favourite books, this would be in my top five. Little by Edward Carey. This is a stunning piece of semi-gothic historical fiction. It retells a fictionalised version of the life of the young woman who would eventually become Madame Tussaud. Now, Madame Tussaud is mostly known for the Waxworks Museums that have her name, but this is a story about her life. And it is so, so beautiful, so dramatic, so gothic in places, really bleak, kind of twisted in places. I am so amazed by this novel. Edward Carey is incredible. I've talked about him before. I really love what he does. And the beautiful kind of unique thing about this novel is that Carey is also a very talented illustrator. So the book is pretty frequently peppered with illustrations. And because Madame Tussaud was an anatomist, these are all anatomical sketches. Sometimes that's just really cute and cool and pretty. Other times, it's pretty creepy and wonderfully morbid. For example, one of the very first sketches in here is of a prosthetic jaw. Our protagonist, Marie, which was her name before she became Madame Tussaud, was born in 1761. And that jaw belonged to her father, who went off to war and was badly physically damaged and wore this prosthetic jaw. The novel pretty much begins with him going off to war, coming home, and dying soon after, before her mother then takes her own life, and Marie is taken in by this very, very strange, enigmatic, reclusive anatomist who behaves kind of like an adoptive father, but more like a tutor, someone who teaches Marie everything he knows about anatomy. The two of them travel from country to country around Europe before eventually settling in Paris, and building a life and a business out of what they know. Marie lives through the French Revolution. She's invited to work in the Palace of Versailles. She falls in love. She sees tragedy and receives trauma. It's an incredible novel, and it is one of three novels in my life to make me cry. I bawled my eyes out towards the end of this book. Absolutely <laughs> cried buckets. I cannot say enough wonderful things about Little. It is immaculate one of the most beautiful things you'll ever read. This is Fingerbone by Japanese author Hiroki Takahashi. It was translated into English by Takami Nieda, and it is a short, harrowing piece of World War II fiction. And you don't get a lot of World War II fiction told from the Japanese perspective. This novel has been praised by Yoko Ogawa and Hiromi Kawakami, two of my favorite Japanese authors, and it deserves that praise. It's set in Papua New Guinea, our protagonist is a nameless narrator, and we spend about half our time in a field hospital as he recovers from bullet wounds, and the other half in the thick of the jungle. And the main thing about this book is camaraderie. Our protagonist meets and befriends multiple people, and often he has to say goodbye to them as they succumb to their wounds, or quite often to malaria. There's a lot of sickness that they're going through, and in that way, this book really reminds me of the poetry of Wilfred Owen. Owen fought on the front lines in the trenches during World War I, and he often wrote about exposure, the elements, the diseases, the day-to-day -day difficulties aside from getting shot. This book is very, very similar. This is an anti-war novel in a lot of ways that asks us to just wonder what it was all for. I have so many thoughts about this book that you can check out in other places, and I'm just so amazed by its strength. The fact that it doesn't go into politics. 
Instead, it just presents you with a man's life and his circumstances and asks you to think about the politics of war. Here's a guy fighting in the jungle. What do you think about that? How beautifully simple is that? On a much happier note, this is Nettle Black by Nat Reeve, who is an expert in Victorian history, culture, and literature. Nettle Black is a dazzlingly hilarious, laugh out loud funny, very, very charming piece of historical fiction. It echoes the works of Terry Pratchett in its tone and its events, and it's also pretty similar to the film Hot Fuzz by Edgar Wright. It's set in the late 19th century, and it tells the story of a young woman who's from a pretty fancy family in Surrey, and she's about to be married off, and she doesn't want to be, so she just runs away. She escapes her home, and a series of absurd events leads her to accidentally be wrangled into working as part of a local vigilante group. They're not the police, they're a group of local vigilantes who have taken it upon themselves to sort out crimes big and small in their little town. And there is an actual mystery, something much bigger than they expect, occurs when a real human skull is found in a chest in a prop box at the local theatre. This is also a book that is an exploration of gender, as our protagonist meets someone who is non-binary and starts questioning their own gender expression during this time period. And it's also written by a writer who is non-binary. It's so laugh out loud funny. This is an incredibly witty and charming book. It is really, really Terry Pratchett-esque. It utilizes so many aspects of its era in so many clever and beautiful ways. You'll never read a piece of historical fiction quite like this. They're so often overly serious and gothic, and this is a charmingly funny laugh out loud book. I adore Nettle Black. It is perfect in so many ways, so unexpected, so beautiful, and fucking funny. This is Our Hideous Progeny by C.E. McGill. Imagine, you're in your early 20s, you've never written a book before, and for your debut novel, you decide to write a spiritual sequel to Frankenstein. The gall, the confidence, the courage it takes to do that and do it well? Jesus Christ. And McGill did it. Our Hideous Progeny is a dedication to Frankenstein. It is a beautiful piece of historical fiction. It is wonderfully gothic. It is exciting. And it's full of dinosaurs. This is a book set in 1850s Britain, at a time only a few decades after we actually started digging up dinosaur remains. At this point in British history, there was a kind of golden age of science, exploration, discovery, invention, and a lot of theft from every other culture and country in the world. Our protagonist, Mary, doesn't know it yet at the beginning, but she is the great niece of Victor Frankenstein. She and her husband, Henry, are having problems. She had a baby who died shortly after being born, and her husband has been burying his grief by gambling away all their money. But she and Henry are also budding science people. She's been doing illustrations for journals, he's trying to make it big into the world of geology, and so the two of them are doing their best to solidify a place in the world of science. And then Mary finds out that her great uncle was Victor Frankenstein, she finds his journals, his diaries. She basically finds the novel Frankenstein, learns that he successfully built a live human thing out of body parts and tries to do the same thing, only this time with a dinosaur. I'll leave it there, I won't tell you any more. Our Hideous Progeny is one of the coolest books of recent years. I am utterly amazed by it. As you may or may not know, Frankenstein is my favorite book. So I was very, very happy to read this. And it didn't disappoint. It's an incredible piece of gothic historical fiction, a dedication to my favorite novel, and a beautiful, exciting book about dinosaurs. Frankenstein meets dinosaurs, you can't lose. One of the most surprising books I have ever read in my life was Lincoln in the Bardo by George Saunders. I don't talk about this very much, but I'm a big fan of George Saunders. I love his short stories, and this is an incredible novel. I didn't know that going into it but this is actually one of the few books I've read multiple times. It's so wonderfully strange. It tells the story of William, Abraham Lincoln's son, who died tragically young around the age of 10 or 11. We mostly follow William after his death as he exists in this 
purgatory-like space called the Bardo. Now, the Bardo comes from Buddhism, and I don't know much about it, I'm not going to pretend to, that's pretty much all I know, is that it is a kind of liminal space between life and death, between Earth and whatever comes next. And William is in the Bardo, and he meets a bunch of other ghostly men, people who tell him their stories, the group kind of adventure around together, and you learn about them as you go, and we also flip back to the real world as Abe Lincoln cries over the loss of his son, works through his grief, visits his son's tomb, and tries to make peace with what happened as best he can. It's a very, very unusual novel. Not just in its setting, its tone, and its concept, but also in the way that it's written, in a very experimental literary way. Lincoln in the Bardo is beautiful. It really took me by surprise. It is very surreal in places, but it never gets away from you. It never intimidates. It's just beautiful. A gorgeous meditation on grief in the most unexpected way possible. Back to something arguably a bit more fun, at least from my perspective, the Leviathan by Rosie Andrews. This is a piece of British Gothic fiction that astonished me because of how absurdly camp it is, but not in a way that becomes obtuse and cringe and awkward. It is a book that's having fun with its setting, its tone, its concept, its characters. This book is set during the English Civil War. Our protagonist is a young man who comes home to his rural farm to find that his 16-year-old sister is very, very upset because they've got this new servant, and she is sure that the servant is sexually abusing their father and trying to get something from him. Maybe money, probably money. That's how the book begins. But then in the next chapter, we flip forward to our protagonist as an elderly man who has some monstrous thing in his attic and periodically, every few days, he goes up to the attic to this thing, and he feeds it, and he makes sure that it's safe and secure. And we don't know what it is, or where it came from, but we know that the main story will lead us there, and eventually these two things are going to collide. To go back to Frankenstein for a sec, one of my favourite things about that novel is how camp and overblown it is. The language is absurd. It is overly descriptive, even for the time period that it was written in. Nobody talks like the characters in Frankenstein. It is a wonderfully camp piece of exaggerated fiction. And this is very similar. The Leviathan really enjoys being almost over the top in its language, its events, and the way its characters behave. It is stunning. It is bleak and dark and gothic, but in a very camp way. So rather than feeling oppressively, frighteningly, gothic and bleak, there's a cartoonishness to the bleakness and the darkness. And trying to get that tone right is incredible. A very deft piece of writing. I loved The Leviathan. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did, but this is one of my favourite pieces of historical fiction. For a while, I didn't really like the idea of retellings of Greek classics and Greek mythology being included in the umbrella of historical fiction, but you can definitely look at it that way. Because you've got your Greek mythology stories, the ones that include heroes, and more specifically gods and monsters. Things from mythology, things that are not real. And then you've got the ones that are based on the Trojan War, the ones that are based on the Odyssey, the Iliad, and these are historical fiction. And my favourite of them is Clytemnestra. This is a debut novel by Costanza Cassati, and it is immaculate. It tells the story of the titular Clytemnestra, who was the sister of Helen, as well as the unfortunate wife of the cruel and brutal tyrant Agamemnon. She gave birth to four of his children, most famously Iphigenia and Electra, and this is her story. This is her entire life story. Her youth with Helen, her brief marriage to a decent, nice guy who was eventually murdered by Agamemnon, and her eventual marriage to Agamemnon, while Helen is married off to Agamemnon's brother, Menelaus, and then is kidnapped by Paris and taken to Troy. And this is that story from Clytemnestra's perspective. If you know the details of this from other books, films, plays, you know it's a bleak story you know she goes through a lot. And a lot is an understatement. This is her life. This is what she went through. And this is how she emerged victorious and became known as a murderer. 
Here's one you might not have come across before. I almost hadn't. For thy great pain, have mercy on my little pain. This is a debut novel by Victoria Mackenzie. It's only 150 pages long, and it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever read. It's based on the lives of two real women, two very important medieval women. It's set in the early 15th century, pre-Shakespeare, in Norfolk, England. We have two women, both of whom have seen visions of Christ. One woman, who eventually takes the name Julian, decides to become an anchoress. This is something I'd never heard of before. It is a holy role where you basically hide yourself away in a cell attached to a local church. Anchoresses never leave their cell, ever. And she lives in that cell for 23 years, after losing her family, after losing her child, after going through so much, and disease constantly taking things away from her, and the fact that she's seeing visions of God, she chooses to hide away in this cell and basically act like a confessional. People come to her window and ask for advice, and she gives it. And the whole time she's there, for over two decades, she writes a book, bit by bit. Our other protagonist is Marjorie, who's much younger than Julian. Her story begins when Julian is already in the cell. She does something very different. When she starts seeing these visions, she proudly talks about them. She tells her family, and she even stands in her local town square and repeats what she's seen and behaves like a prophet. Problem is, these are two women in the medieval period, and what she's doing is very, very dangerous and could lead her to be imprisoned or killed. And eventually, she will go to Norwich to seek the advice of the anchoress. That's what the whole book is building towards, is their meeting, which happens at the end. And what comes of that meeting is historically true, and it's really, really fascinating. I urge you to check this book out. It's an incredible piece of feminist medieval historical fiction. Then we have The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper. This is set in Pompeii, and usually when we think about Pompeii, we think about volcanoes. But this is the story of a woman called Amara, who ends up working in a brothel. It's the story of what she does, how she survives, how she gets ahead, how she uses her wit and her wiles to move through and above her station. But it's also a book about friendship, the bonds that are created between the sex workers at this brothel. The men that she meets and manipulates, the women that she befriends and bonds with and survives with. The Wolf Den is stunning. I've done a full video on it that you can check out. I haven't read the sequel yet, and I know it's a trilogy. I will get to the other two. But this is an awesome piece of historical fiction, and something that should be celebrated for talking about sex workers, especially in an historical context, something we do not see very often, if at all. And finally, we have one of the best pieces of British historical fiction that anyone will ever write ever, Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This won the Women's Prize. It is incredible. I love this book so, so much. I read it during lockdown in the summer of 2020 when it first came out. I was a very different person back then, and I found this book so alluring, so beautiful. It is a piece of historical fiction about the people in Shakespeare's life who aren't Shakespeare himself. In fact, in the book, William Shakespeare is never named. He's just called the Bard. And our protagonist mainly is his wife, Agnes. Agnes Hathaway, or Anne, was the wife of Shakespeare. And in here, she's also a kind of cunning woman. We learn her story, we learn her life, we learn about her strange family. And our other protagonist is their son, Hamnet, who sadly, tragically died far too young, and his death inspired Shakespeare to write Hamlet. This is that story. This is partially the story of Agnes Hathaway's life and her marriage to the Bard and partly the story of how Hamnet died, what that was like for his family, and what it led to in the end. It's stunning. An incredible feat of literature. One of my favourite books. A beautiful, beautiful novel, and I think it's time for me to reread this. Hamnet is an absolute masterpiece of historical fiction. I really, really love this one. Okay, there were 10 incredible pieces of historical fiction. I have a lot more that you can check out on the website. And if you enjoyed this, consider supporting me on Patreon.
My patrons are absolutely wonderful, amazing people. I am so lucky to have them, and I would love your support as well. It would really mean the world to me. Go check these books out. Go check out the other 50 or so that I've read and talked about on the website. Support me on Patreon if you can, and subscribe for books.